in total, we had about 42 documents on corporations or so on businesses. Um, so that would include their CSR reports and, and all the rest. Uh, we came up with about with 34 documents published by civil society groups, 36 documents published by governments, and 72 published by bilater bilateral and multilateral organizations. And this were of varying sizes. I think the bilateral and multilateral were mostly the longest. They were just broad reports of 200 pages. And maybe you'd have within that a few pa five pages related to food security, but the rest is just all promoting government policies and government programs. Now, having that, the next issue was now to go into it to actually code it. So the, the, different pers the three different perspectives became, if, you, if any of you are familiar with Hyper Research, which I can just talk about now, it's a qualitative software tool which you can use to code your data. Uh, within Hyper Research, the, the three different perspectives became our groups. So we're not actually coding saying availability, accessibility, or adequacy, but we're actually coding based on the, the themes that I've talked about now. So uh, when we read in the literature and they're talking about culturally, culturally uh, ad, um, acceptable food, you would actually code using that, uh, that code. So the, the themes that I talked about were our codes, which we're using to go through that data now to code the data. What we did to kind of to since we're all in an academic institution to, to talk about reliability or to think about our reliability or how, uh, uh, of our study was to actually look through 20 documents first, try to code them, see whether we're on the same page with the, with the people who are doing the, with the, with the rest of the research team, and then let the research assistants code the rest of the document. But what we also did within that process was also to have them code on, Google, uh, on a Google Drive so we're always going back to check whether the, the codes were used appropriately and, uh, and that really helped in terms of making sure that what we'll be reporting in the next little while is uh, actually reliable. Uh, the, the one limitation that I would like to talk about too is the idea that the media was, we, we noted that it was a media bias and that's why we went to the second stage of actually going through those different stakeholders to look at their own literature because we, even though within the media they would be saying that they were reporting that stake, uh, civil society says people want culturally acceptable food or they're reporting about an event that civil society held, we, we also noted that there's a media bias. So maybe Anglophone, Cameroon media is talking about certain civil society and it's certain bias because they have a bias towards, against the government and so it's almost like pitching the civil society against the government. So we didn't rely only on the media sources. The media sources, we just use them within the data to kind of contextualize the rest of the data. Uh, the, the research the tool also helped us, hyper research also helped us come up with data, which uh, with quantitative data or statistical data, if you want to put it that way, which, is, which, quite, which kind of helps, uh, helps us put in perspective how the different stakeholders were talking about the different uh, the different themes or different perspectives from the shooter's framework. And I'll pass it over to Adam now to talk okay, about so, it. So then by, by taking uh, what we've already said, uh, just walking away from the, the methodology for a second and back to the framework that we applied, so uh, this is the, the de shooter piece, bringing him in, we, we basically created a, a paper with this kind of a structure where we focus on corporations the perspectives uh, on availability that the corporations articulate in their CSR reports or their annual reports, um, their perspectives on accessibility and public information, advertisements, um, and also on adequacy. And that's kind of the, so that's, you've got four sections of, of the paper here, corporations, civil society, governments, and multilaterals and bilaterals. And under each, under each section, uh, or each subsection, I guess, availability, accessibility, or adequacy, we talk about the statistical content, and then we talk about what the stats don't get. And this is where it gets interesting because the stats give you one perspective of what's happening and then the actual content of the materials is just, it's just fascinating because it's not, you, know, you can't just walk into this and say business and civil society groups don't see eye to eye. Well, guess what they do on a bunch of things. And governments and civil society sometimes see eye to eye as well. Uh, so you gotta take a look at the specifics. And, and this is what we try to do. So in the media sample, like uh, Alexander was saying, this was just the contextual uh, contextual piece. So we, we use the media sample, recognizing there's some bias within media reporting uh, throughout the region and a lot of, of media that's, that's, that's not free in particular places. Uh, think about Chad or Central African Republic. Um, 
we have 42% uh, of, 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 of the hits that we had on our codes uh, were on availability, um, about 40% roughly equal uh, on accessibility themes, and then a, a smaller proportion on, on adequacy. So this was across those 602, uh, I think it was 602 articles uh, or reports from the media. And uh, again, from Alexander mentioned, it was Factiva, which includes all Africa and Press Service and a bunch of other media outlets. So this is, I guess, the context that you can see here in the media, ma major attention to availability and accessibility, a little bit less on, on the nutrition and, and the culture. Now let's just, just head right into the, the business perspectives then. Now this is from the own documents, documents produced by businesses themselves. And, uh, and I think the first thing to note here is, uh, well, this is from 42 annual CSR reports, uh, annual report CSR reports and publicly available documents. Um, in terms of, of what we saw, um, a major focus on availability, a little bit less on, on accessibility type themes, and, and you know, relative lack of attention to, to adequacy. And, and well, what, what do all these things mean? Well, let's uh, take a look at availability. On availability, uh, which was the preoccupation, many companies in their communications talk about sustainability. They talk about extension. Um, so 20 of the, of the 77 were sustainability, 19 were on extension, so the extension of agricultural knowledge to producers, uh, 6 were on production, and a few on technologies. So in the materials we reviewed, corporations that were not directly involved in agriculture didn't generally talk about food, even if they, they weren't linking sustainability to food, sorry. They talked about sustainability, but they would do so in ways that weren't linked to food unless they were directly involved in agricultural production, which is understandable, because if you're a company and you're not involved in agricultural production, you might not necessarily talk about it. Uh, but what's interesting here in this data is a divergence between companies that believe to enhance availability you must have food aid and companies that believe that domestic production needs to be maximized to secure uh, more availability. So for example, Heracles, which is a, a firm that's considered, they're, build, uh, they're making a, a 55,000 hectare uh, oil palm plantation in the southwest of Cameroon, where Alexander is from, not very far away. and. Uh, this firm is, uh, is supporting uh, the giving of food donations as a durable solution to uh, food security issues in the area. So aid, rice, and fish. Give them rice, give them fish. This is a, this is a sustainable solution, that's how they're presenting it. Whereas other firms, um, including uh, Samdia, which is operating in, in five different countries, it's an agricultural processor, uh, wheat and sugar primarily. They're talking about the need to, uh, for local consumption of domestic production. So increasing domestic production of foods like sugar and, and, and consuming that, that locally as a way that, that could enhance availability. So, so you've got this kind of divide amongst corporations on, on how to actually increase the availability of food, whether it's just you know, giving aid or whether it's actually um, producing more domestically. Now, um, some companies offer extension advice. Most of those hits on, on extension were actually from one company. So across all these documents that review, one company actually was very obsessed with, with helping producers to, uh, to think through the production strategies, and, and many others didn't even touch it. So that was interesting. Um, on technologies, though, I think there is a huge corporate divide, divide between corporations involved in conventional inputs, so conventional agrochemicals, pesticides, fertilizer, herbicides, and those that would support more of an organic agriculture. So Sundia, which is a firm that I already mentioned, um, that's managed by the current head of the French Council of Investors in Africa, Alexandre Vilgren, is on record as saying that smallholder organic alternative inputs are where we want to go. And at the same time, Olam, which is a Singapore-based commodity trader, they're constructing in partnership with Tata Chemical and the government of Gabon a massive fertilizer plant in Libreville. They're on record as saying we need to have more agrochemical uh, production in the region to ensure available food. So you've got corporations saying smallholder organics are the way to availability, and you've got others, Olam, saying the exact opposite and doing the exact opposite. This is going to be, I think, a $1.5 billion fertilizer plant in Gabon. Now that's, uh, that's the availability piece. Now on accessibility, um, as you would, you would suspect, many companies are really happy to talk about uh, income generation, how large-scale agricultural plantations, how resource <coughs> operations, extractive industries uh, lead to income, which enables people to purchase food. So you know, getting a job is a source of food security in that literature. And, and lot, that's, that's, I guess, pretty self-explanatory. Now on the, on the adequacy uh, piece, there wasn't a lot of attention to this. Um, health uh, was the preoccupation, about six, six of those hits were on, were on health, and uh, 
Heineken actually through one of its subsidiaries in, in Congo Brazzaville, Brasserie du Congo, um, they talk about nutrition education and brewing a better future, so making smart consumer choices. This, is, this was their, uh, their public information. Um, but not a lot of nutrition gets into the central tenets of, uh, of CSR policy, so companies that are very big, Marathon Oil and Equatorial Guinea, Exxon Mobil, they don't necessarily <coughs> talk about nutrition whatsoever. So it's just a few outliers that are, that are focusing in on, on that. So I, I, we argue that uh, nutrition and dietary adequacy is, is not necessarily at the forefront of corporate communications on food, and cultural appropriateness is basically not on the radar. So that's, that's the essence of the, the corporate perspective. Well, what about civil society? Well, here you can see uh, you know, a preponderance of attention has been devoted to accessibility challenges, the challenges of making food more accessible for people, um, and, then, and then kind of a, also attention to availability, 23% of communications on that theme, and terms that we coded as being associated with adequacy, also making it in uh, to that literature quite a bit. So taking a look at, at some civil society views of the 65 uh, instances where, where civil society groups talk about uh, availability, about 20 of those we found were on sustainability themes, and, and, and in about equal measure were on production themes. And interestingly, on the sustainability side, most civil society organizations are, are talking about the environmental costs of conventional, extensive agricultural growth, and they offer a sustainable alternative. So they're saying smallholder agriculture is more sustainable. There are just huge environmental costs associated with extensive growth of large-scale agricultural projects like the rubber and pollen projects we've taken a look at. That's not surprising. Um, but uh, what is surprising, I think, is that civil society groups tend to link plantations to food insecurity directly. Uh, you know, you're pulling people out of food production for local consumption. Um, this is, you know, whether it's for resource development, employment on, on oil and gas, uh, or whether it's for, for the development of plantations, the idea that there is some uh, connection between wage labor and, and food insecurity. Now, um, they also, you know, civil society groups were challenging across the board perspectives on, on productivity that emphasize the old view of productivity, the, you know, per uh, unit of output uh, uh, per hectare approach uh, over a yearly time horizon, not over a longer time horizon. So, you know, emphasizing the dangers of conventional inputs as well. So these are the standard kind of critiques of, of conventional agriculture that, that, you know, you would expect. What I find to be pretty interesting, though, is, is just the, is this, you know, massive attention that the civil society groups are paying to accessibility issues. And when they're doing so, they're talking largely about incomes, uh, inequality, and resources. They also talk about gender and water issues, but for the most part, the, the preponderance of communications are on income, on inequality, and resources. And, and the belief is that formal employment reinforces dependence on imported processed foods and fuels the atrophy of domestic agricultural systems. Civil society groups across, I think, five of the six countries actually articulate language just like this. If formal employment makes people dependent on imported processed foods, this atrophies domestic agriculture. It actually renders the place less food secure than it otherwise would be, which is pretty critical. I mean, this is a, a interesting, another interesting aspect is this inequality piece from civil society. Um, the inequality of access to land is just all over this literature. So in, in, you know, if you're talking about inequalities in civil society, you're probably talking about land access issues. And I've got a, a lot of quotes, but probably not a lot of time to, to start to, to head in that direction. I can maybe in the Q&A head there. Um, on adequacy, though, I think uh, what was really, uh, and is, is you're going to see a, quite a bit of a difference with the, the corporations. Uh, on adequacy, about half the communications were on culture and traditional food, and the other half were on health and safety of food. Uh, so, you know, there's a big attention to traditional land rights, and, and in Chad, a, a civil society group, I think Angela might remember this one, uh, was, was pretty straight up on this one, um, you know, talking about changing food cultures and food ways, um, and in particular, this was, this was related to the oil industry in Chad. Um, Oil, employment in the oil industry in Chad, male control over wages has fueled alcoholism, prostitution, and spousal conflict. It's created a bar culture and a local alcoholic drink industry to the detriment of traditional diets. That's just one quote from, from a civil society organization in Chad. So the traditional diets are disappearing because everybody's got an incentive to, to go to the bar and keep up with the Jones. You've got to hang out after work. And uh, food safety, uh, I guess, is also a theme here. And, uh, and, and also lots of attention to acute malnutrition. So I'm just kind of rushing through this. There's a lot of data. Uh, government perspectives. Um, now here you can see uh, something that might look 